Okay, good day, good evening, good morning, everybody. Um, Colin R. Turner here. Um, today I have a very special video for you from um, a guy that I've been uh, meaning to interview for quite some time. Um, this is, I'm going to introduce you first to um, Bruce M. Boghossian, and I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, he's a professor of maths at Tufts University since 2000 and served in the chair of mathematics there uh, until 2010. Um, he has been a member of the American Physical Society since 2000 and uh, National Academy of Sciences of the Republic of Armenia and a recipient of Tufts University's Distinguished Scholar Award in 2010. Um, Dr. Boghossian's interests include mathematical fluid dynamics and kinetic theory, and more recently, the application of these disciplines to the problem of wealth distribution. He also maintains a strong interest in international education and has served on multiple advisory committees for Tufts University international programs. So with all that said, welcome Professor Boghossian, and I do hope I've pronounced that correctly. Am I, am I good? Yes, you're good. Uh, thank you, Colin. <laughs> Great. Um, now, I, just for those people listening, um, I've had a very special interest in your work, um, as you were introduced to me by a mutual friend of ours. And um, as you know, I'm somebody who promotes post-money economies or the future types economies or open access economy. And uh, one of the founding uh, reasons for that, of course, is how the, the inefficiencies of our trade and our current system in all its uh, guises has kind of shown itself more and more over the years. Now, I know as, as just as to preface whatever you're going to say, I'm not, um, I'm not putting you, pigeonholing you into the uh, same category as somebody who believes in a post-money world as I would do. But um, I think we certainly share a lot of opinions on the underlying problems and the underlying mechanisms of society that have created a lot of the problems that we've seen. And um, I think you, your, your most prominent um, work to date possibly has been the publication of, of a, a paper in the Scientific American or a, as a, um, an a editorial about that paper that you published in 2018, I believe it was. Um, would you like to give us uh, a kind of a brief rundown about that article and uh, the paper that um, that began that article or what that's about? And remembering, of course, that we're a non-technical audience here, so including myself. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. The, um, the article uses uh, a methodology that has come to be called agent-based modeling, where you, you just imagine a bunch of what we would call economic agents. These could be individuals, they could be corporations, they could be households, anything that can hold wealth and exchange wealth. And you look at a bunch of these, you look at a population of these, a large population, and you come up with some model for how they might trade wealth with each other. And then you look at the global consequences of that trade model that you developed. So you, you try to develop a reasonably realistic model of trade between two of these agents. And then just imagine that you, I mean, this is being done on a computer, clearly, you, you randomly pick two of these agents, you have them conduct a transaction, you, you, you might start them all off with the same wealth, but then two of them will conduct a transaction. You randomly pick another two, they'll have a transaction, another two and another two, and you do this millions or even billions of times, depending on you know, how you set things up. And, and you look to see how wealth distributes itself. And uh, what we found was that uh, under fairly reasonable assumptions, reasonable models of, of trade, and, and in some cases, very simple models of trade, uh, wealth tends to concentrate. So uh, the, uh, the result of this is not any kind of a stable wealth distribution. 
uh, it's it's the runaway concentration of wealth in the hands of an ever decreasing number of individuals. And the only way that we have found to stop this is to uh, have some sort of uh, periodic redistribution of wealth in the society. You can imagine taxing everybody and giving everybody some return on that tax. Uh, some imposed method of redistribution that will stop it from running away okay. aside from that very simple models of trade just result in runaway concentration okay. well look okay. let's, let's I'd like to just stop there for the for a moment because uh, yeah you've basically done this you've more or less summarized the idea of this uh, agent based model that when you apply this a simple trading model of um agents exchanging goods and, or services or whatever, that you, ha- you have found that the wealth concentrates or condenses, as we call it, um, as a result of that, even uh, without external influence or without any other, um, I don't know, um, let, I mean, I know later we'll talk about the, the, the tilted playing field of wealth, but even without that, even if everyone starts with the exact same number of wealth, and you just into, into, put it into that agent-based model that the wealth gravitates towards fewer and fewer people. So that that is, would, would you say that's something that you have effectively mathematically proven or is that too strong a phrase to use at that stage? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of a model. You have two agents coming together. They both have two different values of of wealth. One of them will be the richer agent, the other one will be the poorer agent. And, and let's come up, let, let, let's agree on the following rule. Nobody is willing to um, risk more than 1% of their total wealth in any transaction. And so that means when two agents transact, it's, it's gonna be 1% of the poorer agent's wealth that is the most that could go back and forth between them. So, right, you just calculate, you know, 1% of the poorer agent's wealth, and that's the amount that could go one way or the other. And how do you decide on who gets it and who loses it? Let's suppose, just for a moment, you flip a fair coin, absolutely fair coin. If it comes up in heads, let's say it goes from the poorer agent to the richer agent, If it comes up tails, it goes the other way. The coin is absolutely fair. Um, That's your transaction. So look at the two agents, take 1% of the poorer one's wealth, flip a fair coin to decide which direction it goes in. Now, again, do this millions or billions of times. All the wealth will go into the hands of one of the two agents. And yes, that has been mathematically proven in a series of papers that were published in uh, refereed scientific literature between, well, the model was first, that model was first thought of around 2002, and there were numerical experiments that were done at that time on a computer, and it indicated that the wealth concentrated. Um, Numerical experiments don't correspond to mathematical proof in the eyes of the mathematician, But later on in 2014, 15, and 16, there were a series of papers Mm -hmm. uh, by my group and by Christophe Choro in in Paris that that demonstrated mathematically with mathematical rigor that Mm -hmm. wealth tends to concentrate and inequality tends to grow. That's that's fantastic. And just to to be sure, uh, just to be specific about what you're saying, that even if all the agents start off with equal wealth. Um, over time, a ran- the random, the, just the sheer randomness of the fair coin tosses will introduce a small variation, fluctuation in the wealth between the agents, which increases over time. Okay, so the 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 people who who lose out at the beginning through sheer bad luck. They will tend to lose more and more as as uh, as the as more transactions take place. Is that is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, the, 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 the poorer you are, the more likely you are to lose. Um, that's not obvious, but it is demonstrable in this game. 
yeah. even if you start off everybody with the same wealth, mm -hmm. the, um, the the terminology that's used is that the symmetry will break yeah. in the beginning of the game, thanks to yes. just the luck of the first few transactions. And, and then uh, it, that, that disparity in wealth only yep. tends to grow. Yeah. And of course, the percentage of the wealth of the poorer person is obviously less of a percentage of the wealthier person. So if the wealthier person loses that transaction, they lose less uh, relatively than the poorer, poorer agent does, right? I mean, they're, they're, um, they're risking yeah, less. Yeah. They're losing less. That's right. The, the, the tricky thing is you could flip that argument around and you could say that if the... Um, if the poor agent wins, they win more. Ah, of a, yes. A right. So, <laughs> uh, so it's not clear. It really is not intuitively clear who's going to benefit from that. But it turns out that it's it's devastating in the long run. And the poorer you get, the worse it is. Okay. Essentially, everybody's wealth in the game tends to decrease mm -hmm. exponentially. And the poorer you are, the faster the exponential decrease. Would you say that um, that what you're proposing or what you're um, what you've discovered is is common knowledge among economists, say, or politicians? I mean, is this is this widely known that um, that just ordinary trading, even among equal agents, it precipitates wealth condensation? Do you think this is widely known, or do you think people aren't aware of this? People who should be aware of it, say. Yeah, I mean, among. Physicists, mathematicians, natural scientists, I would say, this phenomenon has been uh, identified as, as uh, something that could be important to the economy. Since uh, about 2000, there was a paper on what came to be called wealth condensation by Jean-Philippe Bouchot and Marc Mézard in, in Paris. Um, and uh, this idea that, that you could get condensation of wealth in this way, in this case to the very wealthiest agents, is, is a phenomenon that is familiar to physicists for various reasons. In the economic world, I think this would be a more uh, alien kind of, of concept. It's, uh, there are uh, heterodox economists who uh, do understand this and do read the literature that comes from maybe more the, the mathematics and, and physics, natural sciences community. But within the community of social scientists, the, the understanding of, of economics and trade and transactions and wealth distribution is more one of balance. Mm. It's that prices will set themselves by supply and demand. This is the, the sort of classical, you know, uh, and later neoclassical arguments, classical going back to Adam Smith's ideas, mm -hmm. um, neoclassical, uh, the ideas that were put forth by um, Kenneth Arrow and Gerard de Bru in the 1950s, that things will equilibrate, that supply, demand uh, will set prices, mm -hmm. it will cause trade to equilibrate, and you'll get some natural distribution, but mm -hmm. that distribution will settle down. The idea that it could be a runaway concentration of wealth is not something that, that economists like. Uh, you know, if the model that I said with the, mm -hmm. the flip of a coin is not something that mm -hmm. they would subscribe to because it involves, in some sense, one agent winning and one agent losing. Mm -hmm. And an economist would say that the trade happens when trade happens, nobody loses. If one party would lose, they would. In a, in a free market, refuse to enter the transaction in the first place. So there's no way that that could happen. But the assumptions that go into those economic models uh, are more and more being called into question. And so this model would be considered very heterodox in the world of economics. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, because I think we need more um, more ways to uh, proof with prove with rigor the 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 sort of what we what we see all around us and the the huge amount of uh, wealth concentration which has happened, and um, though I don't have data to hand, I'm sure that you you can you probably agree that this pattern has repeated pretty much in every developed country or everywhere that that champions a free market. 
that um, that this pattern seems to continually emerge again and again. And of course, I think it's um, I think what, another thing economists might argue is that, of course, in real life, it's not a random. Uh, coin toss that there are um, advantages and disadvantages between one person trading and another, um, but I think I think the I think the assumption or the presumption that everyone always wins from a trade I think is possibly incorrect because uh, some people obviously you know again because of the the relative wealth of of what you're purchasing may be higher or lower depending on your own wealth. Um, that some people, even though there, you know, maybe there are not absolute losers from a trade between two people, but some per, some one of the parties will inevitably win slightly more than the other party. So, would you agree that 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 it's not just a case of you know one person completely wins, the other person completely loses? It's more. Um, it's more subtle than that, that some people tend to win a little bit more and some tend a little bit less. For example, if, you, if, you're, if you're desperate to buy something, I don't know, if you're, a tire blows out in your car or something like that and you're, you, know, you have $500 in your pocket and somebody's there offering you a tire for $200, you, know, you, might, you might pay them for that because you're just desperate to, to have the tire. So they are winning from that transaction and you're losing you could you could say from a financial point of view but um do, do you agree that that's um that the that there's a disparity in in normal trades where one person tends to have the upper hand and one person might have more of a lower hand and that is really what creates the um the oligarchical tendency that you're talking about uh, yes, there's there's no question that that real transactions are much more subtle and, and nuanced than the model transaction that I described. There's a maybe a difference, um, cultural cultural difference between how different communities construct mathematical models. Um, uh, I would say some uh, scientific approaches, including those in in economics, the social sciences, as well as engineering, try to include as many things in as, as possible in their models mm. in order to make the models more accurate. Mm. And, and that's, that's one legitimate way of constructing mathematical models. In some areas like physics and uh, theoretical physics and mathematics, the tendency is to remove as many irrelevant things from the model as possible so that even if the model isn't quantitatively perfect, it is showing you what features are important and what features are less important. It's stripping the model down to its essentials in, in some sense. So mathematicians in many cases tend to prefer simplified models for this reason. But you're right in that real transactions are more involved and uh, uh, you know we are looking at trying to improve the transactional model, make it more like what economists uh, would prefer. And what we find when we do that, and that this is recent work that our, our group has, has looked at, is that um, our models are more similar to ideas that have emerged from behavioral economics, mm -hmm. uh, ideas such as uh, the prospect theory of Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, uh, for which Kahneman won the Nobel Prize the, uh, in, in economics. Uh, that model and the model that I just described to you capture one feature that humans have, and that is risk aversion. Mm -hmm. We're just more angry and outraged about losing ten dollars then we are pleased about winning ten dollars and that creates an asymmetry between winning and losing that if you think about it for a minute features in that model i just described to you why do we restrict the amount of the transaction to some percentage of the poorer agents wealth well it's because nobody wants to lose more than they have if i had a transaction with uh, 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 Elon Musk, let's say, um, 
you know, I could afford to lose 1% of my total wealth. I certainly could not afford to lose 1% of his total wealth. So it's 1% of the poorer agent's wealth. By building that into the model, we have in some sense captured a little bit of risk aversion, the same risk aversion that Kahneman and Tversky coming from really quantitative psychology um, knew about and tried to build into economic modeling and that resulted in prospect theory. So you can make a point of contact with economics Mm-hmm. There, okay, and um, when in I think in the, your twenty eighteen paper, you um, you add, obviously your model is very simplistic in terms of the the fair coin toss over time, but then you added in a few other parameters into the model that would account take account of things like wealth distribution or redistribution. And um, I can't remember what were the other two. No offense, redistribution and. Um, um, redistribution was was certainly one of them. So, to what yeah. extent is the society redistributed? Mm-hmm. And not, a second one is to what extent is the playing field tilted toward the wealthy? Yes. Should the coin be a little bit biased in favor of yeah. the wealthier agent? The third one that we introduced in a later paper in 2019 was um, to what extent are there people in debt in the population? To what extent are there negative wealth agents? Hmm. And this gave us, a, in the end, a three-parameter model. But you were able then to to map, as to say, to say, to, to coin a phrase, you were able to map your model onto the existing data, right? Of say of the U.S. economy, isn't that right? You were able to take the the Lorenz curve of the U.S. economy from the the wealthiest or from the poorest up to the wealthiest, and you were able to um, manipulate the parameters of your model to to actually fit the data, which I think was a very useful exercise. And um, your the the accuracy of what you done that of what you did there was like really, really very extremely close to the data. So that's that's really um, important, isn't it? And was it difficult to arrive at those uh, different variables and parameters to go into the formula to actually match the, the data that exists? We, we did experiment with these models quite a bit before settling on on that one. Um, the um, but but you're right. The model, as simple as the model is, it uh, and with only three parameters, it fits U.S. wealth data going back to 1989 or thereabouts um, with a fraction of a percent accuracy about one fifth of one percent accuracy it can it can match the um empirical lorenz curves uh, as you point out and lorenz curves are a, a careful measure of the the distribution of of household wealth in the u.s mm-hmm. and we also managed to match um wealth distribution data that came from the european central bank with similar accuracy so the European Central Bank, I think, services 14 countries or something like that. We were able to look at, this was just for one time epic around 2010 or 12 or thereabouts. Mm-hmm. We were able to look at their wealth distributions for each of these 14 countries. And once again, to within a fraction of 1%, it was able to, the three parameter mm-hmm. model was able to match the data. That's that's really amazing that you were able to do that. But what what lessons could be learned from that? For example, if you were to present that data to, you know, influential economists, what would they, what would that suggest to them that needed to be to be done to um, prevent that uh, that very steep curve? Um, well, uh, yeah, preventing it is is one thing, but one thing that we did learn about it and. This is shown in a, a graph in that Scientific American article that you mentioned that was a bit surprising to us is, um, first of all, the model has a, a very interesting bit of phenomenology that can happen in it. Um, as, as you mentioned, there is both redistribution in the model and there is this thing that we call wealth attained advantage. It is the extent to which the playing field is tilted in favor of the wealthy. And there's two parameters, two sort of knobs that you can turn in the model 
to either increase redistribution or increase wealth attained advantage or turn the knobs the other way to decrease those things. Mm -hmm. And what you find in the model, and this is, is uh, it can be verified uh, theoretically as well as observed in numerical experiments with the model, is that um, as long as wealth attained advantage is less than in, in this parameter sense is, is less than redistribution, um, you, you get a, you know, an uneven wealth distribution. It's certainly a, a wide distribution of, of possible wealth, but you don't get runaway concentration of wealth. Mm-hmm. The moment that wealth attained advantage becomes greater than redistribution, suddenly you can get the appearance of an oligarchy. You get some amount, some limited amount of wealth uh, condensation, as we were discussing. Maybe 30% of household wealth condenses to a fraction of the population that is that is nearly zero. And this happens naturally from this simple three-parameter model. But it's very close to what you would observe in mm-hmm. in a place like the US. As you said, developing countries have this runaway concentration of wealth. There are 400 people in the United States, the richest 400 people have a combined wealth that is greater than or equal to that of the lowest 60%. In other words, 400 people have as much wealth, the 400 people at the top have as much wealth as 200 million people at the bottom. Okay, that's what wealth condensation looks like in in real life. Um, That's 30% of US household wealth that's locked up in a as a fraction, a negligible amount of individuals, when people talk about the top 1%, they are completely missing the point. This is the top few ten thousandths of 1% that that are holding as much wealth as the bottom 60%. Wow. And from what you say there, the the ability for the wealthy to actually uh, attain greater advantage is more important is more significant than the ability to redistribute wealth. I don't. I don't know how do you actually equate. How do you equate one one parameter with the other? How do you how do you measure uh, how much is redistributed fairly against how much the table is tilted? I mean, are they are they comparable? Even those two parameters somehow that you can you can slide from one to the other or. <laughs> That was actually part of the challenge yeah. of creating the model was to come up with parameters that are what we call dimensionless parameters of the model. They don't depend on what units of wealth you choose. They don't depend on other important, uh, unimportant things like that. They're really dimensionless features of the model. Um, mm-hmm. that and And they're natural in some sense. One of them is... Um, you know, for example, how do you choose the bias in the probability of the coin flip that favors the wealthy? Well, one thing you could do is make it different, uh, make it proportional to the difference in wealth between the two agents. No. That's not good because it would depend on whether you were measuring wealth in dollars or euros or renminbi or whatever. So what you do in, in, instead is divide that difference by the mean wealth of the population. That gets rid of the units. Okay. And then, you know, there's other features you have to put in. But when you're done with that and you come up with some dimensionless thing, you put a parameter in front of it. And now you can tune that parameter. That gives you the bias, the amount by which the coin flip differs by 50% heads, 50% tails. Right. And so we tried to define these in a natural way like that. And it turned out that we came up with two parameters, which when they are equal, the economy is just on the verge of oligarchy. When one is greater than the other, you get a certain amount of wealth locked up mm-hmm. in oligarchy. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the wealth distribution, how do you, um, redistribution, how do you, 
How do you um, make that a parameter? Do you subtract a certain amount of wealth from the wealthiest and give it to the poor? I mean, is it just a Robin Hood basically formula there? It is. In fact, I, I once gave a talk on this where I had a slide with Robin Hood's picture on it describing the, uh, the redistribution model. You, you tax everybody proportionate to their wealth. And then you give it back to people in equal shares. And then you do that per unit time. Um, you, you know, every mm -hmm. X number of transactions, you actually do that. Okay. And then the question is, how big was that tax? The beauty of that model is that it's not obvious from the way I just described it, but that model tends to move everybody toward the mean by the same fraction, right? If you're way above the mean, you move 10% of the way to the mean, let's say. If you're below the mean, you'll move 10% upwards. And every you do this to everybody, and it has the effect of paying for itself. Exactly the amount of money that you take from those above the mean will pay for what you have to give to those below the mean. So the net cost to society is, is zero, but it does cost people above the mean something. Hmm. And another nice feature of it is it preserves everybody's rank, right? If you were the 100th richest person before you did this, you would still be the 100th richest person after you did this. Okay. It just moves everybody proportionally toward the mean. And that parameter just, um, and by the way, this is not the only redistribution model you could come up with. And we've looked at more sophisticated ones than this, but it's, it's an easy one to understand. Mm. Fascinating. Yeah, it's really good. Um, I watched your uh, um, your lecture with the Collège de France, um, which was really uh, interesting, but also a lot of it went over my head. It was quite mathematically uh, intense. Um, but I will drop a link to that uh, video because anyone who's uh, pretty smart on the maths end will probably enjoy watching that and we'll get a lot from it. Um, but uh, I would definitely recommend anyone who's into that to watch that video as well. And um, you mentioned in that, in that uh, lecture that you spent some time in the Soviet Union and um, maybe some, was it somewhere around the time of the collapse of communism or something like that? And you, you witnessed firsthand the, uh, the effect of free market economy, I suppose, uh, being unleashed on, uh, on the, unsuspecting communists is for want of a better word. So what's, uh, what, what's, what's your uh, take, take away from, from all that? Yeah, I lived in uh, the former Soviet Armenia, now the Republic of Armenia. I lived there from 2010 to 2014. I was the president of the American University of Armenia while I was there. And um, that was 20 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, um, so what, what I was observing was sort of the, uh, the maybe the, the, the crater at ground zero of, of the effect of free market economics on the former Soviet Union. Um, it, it, it was a very devastating transition, especially in the 1990s, especially in the early 1990s. Uh, in the case of Armenia, the country became independent in 1991. Uh, but the story was similar to most of the other former Soviet republics, uh, with the exception of Russia, the other uh, 14 Soviet republics. Uh, it, it made a very quick uh, and nearly uncontrolled transition from uh, a very controlled economy, a very uh, 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 well, a, a Marxist-Leninist economy that, that had centralized control, uh, it, it made a quick transition to a uh, nearly unregulated uh, free market in which countries and governments were told to sell off all their assets as quickly as possible, open their doors to foreign competition, um, and uh, uh, deregulate things to attract uh, corporations and make uh, make the, the make it more attractive for corporations to come there. Uh, you, you know, you, if you look back in history, uh, it was the biggest seismic shift in the map of uh, Europe and Asia since World War II. Uh, 
And at the end of World War II, of course, the Western countries came up with the idea, the, the U.S. in particular, uh, with the idea of the Marshall Plan. Uh, the economies of, of many of the countries of Western Europe were, demons, uh, were devastated, and the Marshall Plan supplied, what in retrospect was a, a, a fairly small amount of investment that got the countries back on their feet and uh, uh, developed them and uh, created the, the, the free market countries of Western Europe. But by... 1990, the ideology of the U.S. had changed, in particular in the politics of the 1980s in the U.S., um, this idea that, that the market knows best, that the free market is, is always the way to go, had entrenched itself. And uh, this led to what came to be called shock therapy economics should be imposed on, on the former Soviet countries, that all you have to do is deregulate everything, uh, sell off all government-owned assets, and the whole place will just naturally develop into a market paradise. And um, these weren't you know, mere suggestions, basically. These were conditions that were imposed by the World Bank and the IMF in order to get develop it, uh, development loans that were badly needed by these countries at that time. So whoever the government was in any of these countries went along with these ideas. And the result was devastating. Within 10 years, countries that had uh, a centralized socialist form of government became oligarchies. They, they passed right through, you know, sort of stable market capitalism where they were supposed to end up. And they went straight to... Um, oligarchic kleptocracies, essentially. And um, many of these countries remain so to this, to this day. Uh, in the case of uh, Armenia, there was a democratic revolution in 2018, but um, in, in, in other countries, it persists. In other countries, um, there, there, there have been um, uh, some amount of, of movement away from oligarchy, but I would say in general, 10 of those 14 uh, countries in the Soviet Union could still be accurately described as oligarchies. Would it be the case that um, of, of those countries that came out of communism, that um, maybe the, the generals or the ministers of the government of that time in those countries obviously were, found themselves maybe in a, an extraordinarily privileged position to, be, to enter into a free market economy and they made full use of, of the resources and connections or whatever they had. And maybe that has precipitated the sort of the more dissension into oligarchy. Has that, would you, is, is that be a fair comment or do you think that it really, was it really a, a truly free market? Everyone started out equal? I find that difficult to imagine. No, your, your comment is, is exactly on the mark. Um, in many of these countries, they instituted what, uh, uh, what, what, what is called a voucher privatization, where you take all government assets, factories, buildings, real estate, etc., and you divide it up, you, you, you assess its value, divide that value up into vouchers, and then distribute those vouchers to households proportionate to the number of people in those households which sounds remarkably fair on paper, but it was just on paper. In, in fact, what happened was that there were vouchers, but there were no organized markets for those vouchers. There was nothing like a stock exchange for these vouchers. Right. And there was economic uh, hardship and deprivation and people were hungry. You can't eat vouchers. So people were selling these things on the street, you know, for, 30% or less of their face value. Who brought them up? Well, you put your finger on it. Uh, it was um, the people who had been mid-level managers uh, in privileged positions during Soviet times uh, who knew what these things were worth. Uh, you would, in those days, they would call them apparatchiks. They knew precisely what was worth something, what factory had you know, copper pipes and copper wires in the walls that could be stripped out and sold off, 
which factories had heavy machinery that was valuable, uh, what land was more valuable, which real estate was more valuable, etc. And if they didn't have the capital to take advantage of those things, they at least had the information. And then they would team up with oligarchs, perhaps in Russia, but also in the United States and Western Europe, who were able to provide the investment money, um, in some cases, buying up the electrical grid in a country, making very modest improvements to it and flipping it for profits in the billions within a course of one or two years. So if you knew you had connections that could provide the capital, you had the information, suddenly these billionaires were created and um, they are still there and, and they are still billionaires and, and uh, they're sort of ostentatiously wealthy. You can see spectacular palaces of uh, houses that uh, belong to them. And everybody knows who they are and they own all the big businesses in the country and they own all the majority of the of the press in these countries. Yeah. And uh, this is wealth attained advantage in action. <laughs> in action. And tell me, um, I know you have sort of uh, Armenian roots yourself. Um, I don't know, were you, were, were you born in Armenia? Um, no, I, I uh, was born in the US. Oh, uh, my okay. parents were likewise. My grandparents came from um, a, a portion of historic Armenia that is now uh, yeah. in Turkey. They were victims of the Armenian genocide that happened during World War and, One. And what what would be your opinion of, say, the situation of the, the situation in Armenia, say then and now, say between now and say thirty, forty years ago? Do you think life has improved or disimproved thanks to the free market or? Um, has it just changed into something different that is not neither better nor worse? How would you define it? Um, I, I would say that as a result of, of this, it, it could have been done in, in a much better fashion. It could have been done something more like the Marshall Plan to ease these countries into market economics. For whatever you might think of market economics, if, if your goal is to get countries into market economics, um, it should be done sort of slowly, what a scientist might call adiabatically, and, and move them slowly into it. Mm -hmm. This idea that it could be done uh, by shock therapy economics has resulted in a disaster because oligarchy is easy to create by doing that, and it is much harder to dislodge. Uh, I think that the development of most of these countries, these 14 countries could have, if the process had been managed competently, been, you know, free market uh, paradises uh, or, you know, as close as free market is to a paradise. Mm. They could have eased their way into free markets uh, and traded with the rest of the world, been part of the global supply chain and, and the global value chain. Um, much better than turned out to be the case. Right now, they are trying, you know, desperately to recover from the devastation that was done to them by this horrible transition. They, are, you know, got to see in one generation the um, uh, the worst of free market economics, and it, it could have been done so much better. It seems to me it was a lost opportunity. I know you're a fan of the Monopoly game. You mentioned that, I think, in one of your <laughs> lectures, or this was probably something that uh, precipitated you to ask questions at a young age, and uh, myself as well. And uh, obviously, uh, Monopoly is it's a fantastic experiment because it does more or less demonstrate what, exactly what you're saying, exactly what your papers are suggesting, that we start out with equal agents, over time, uh, one a winner takes all. The, the one one person ends up with all the the money, and the other people end up with nothing. And obviously, a mon monopoly is an extremely exaggerated um, effect of that. You, I suppose you know that monopoly originally originally came from a game called the landlord's game, which was initially to demonstrate why the free market uh, capitalism actually was a bad idea. And the beauty, the beautiful irony is that um, the Parker brothers, who originally 
decided to market the game, they weren't interested in the game that actually that proved the capitalism was uh, was or that, that proved an alternative system. They actually, um, I don't know, in a in a. I think the irony is spectacular that the capitalism actually selected the game that actually was actually disproving its merit. And uh, I wonder uh, what you think about that. And also, I I actually had a quite a interesting thought recently was that since Monopoly as a game has been so widespread and so widely played, has it even has it possibly even had an impact on people's in, people's uh, expectations of life from uh, from childhood? You know, when you play this game as a child, do you start to believe, as I think I did, that maybe this is the way the world works? You basically get out there and you try to win, and you get out, you get as much as you can. Do you think Monopoly even has input it some way into the, the the process of creating a crazy free market economy? It is a complete irony, given its historical origins, what it has been used for. I know that I, I don't think I've played it since I was a child, actually, but I do remember playing it as a child. And um, yeah, I, I think I mean, it's a perfect example of co-option. I think uh, uh, the way that the Parker Brothers moved it from something that was meant to be a critique of capitalism and a critique of the free market to something that um, I think you're quite right. It, they they co-opted it and sort of sold it as these are the skills you need to succeed in life. Uh, the reason I remind people of it now is because when I present ideas like this mathematical model, people are likely to push back at me and say, well, but no, uh, you know, uh, we, we live in a stable market society. Uh, markets can't possibly be inherently unstable as you are claiming they are. The reason they think that is because these instabilities take place over a time scale, you know, that, that can last decades and, and people have finite lifetimes and they don't necessarily um, see this or observe these kinds of trends over time. Um but when you remind them that monopoly games are, you know, much like real life, you all start off with the same amount of money. You're all playing by the same amount of rules. Nobody around the board is, you know, a hundred times smarter than anybody else around the board. You're all about equally smart. Mm -hmm. And yet at the end of the game, one person runs away with all the money. So if it happens in that that sort of little model of the world, what makes you think it doesn't happen in the real world? And that gets people thinking that, yeah, maybe there is something to models. And like of course, in the, in the real world, we know that not everyone starts with the same amount of money. Some people start with an extraordinary amount of money and some people start uh, with, with so little that to actually make any success of themselves is like a, is a titanic task you know, for some people. And, uh, that's yeah. This the that, that only makes matters worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean the the um, the thinking that you know hard work you re capitalism rewards hard work is obviously is something that comes unstuck with your work with your uh, your own model as well. Um, if you were to, if I mean taking your, your own model, which I think is excellent, of course, and I think your work is fantastic and the way it maps onto the thing, but. If you were to somehow reverse engineer that and to map it or to to create an economy based on a correct model, for example, imagine if you could write a model and say, "Well, look, this is the way the economy should be." I mean, have you considered actually um, adjusting your model to actually to say, "Well, this this is the this is an optimum model. Here's the way it should be," and it can even show people, "Well, what are the adjustments that need to be made?" Like, how, how better could we redistribute wealth to make the optimum model? And how better could we stop the table from tilting to create an optimum model? Is that something you've considered or is that or is it something you're working on? It's something that, that I've certainly considered. It's something that I, it's a problem that I've posed to um, students to think about. Um, there are, you know, perhaps ways of doing it where, you know, if you know exactly what the time scale and the uh, 
the tendency is toward wealth concentration, could you just exactly adjust for it in a way that levels the playing field and, and sort of cancels the, the um, endogenous tendency to concentrate wealth, cancels that out and leaves you with a total meritocracy? Mm. That, that would be lovely if you could come up with it. <laughs> um, I, 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 we have thought of it, are thinking about it, but don't have the answers at this point. I mean, obviously, if your your Lorenz curves are um, you know showing a very strong spike at the at the uh, the higher percentile, but what what in your opinion, what should that curve look like? I mean, do you yeah. think we should be striving for an egalitarian curve, a straight line from one corner to another, or is that just inconceivable? Or uh, what what is uh, what's realistic in your opinion? So I, I don't think you could do it even if you wanted to, uh, to, to get a totally egalitarian society. And I don't think people want to. Mm -hmm. There was a marvelous study um, that was done by um, Ariely and Norton were the two authors. Uh, Ariely, Dan Ariely is from Duke University and Norton, I think it's Michael Norton from Harvard Business School. Back around, I want to say 2009 or 10, I'm not positive about the dates, but if you Google those two names, and I think the title of the paper was um, something about one quintile at a time building a, a more equitable society. Uh, if you Google Ariely Norton, one quintile at a time, you'll find it. Okay. Uh, what they did was to, first of all, teach people what quintiles of wealth are. So um, uh, the top 20% of people, what fraction of wealth do they own? The next 20%, what fraction do they own? The next 20%, et cetera. So you get these five fractions and they've got to add up to 100%. And um, you ask people uh, two questions, number one, how do you think wealth is distributed today? And Ariely and Norton present these, these quintiles, the way that people think wealth is distributed. And then you say, how would you like it to be distributed? And uh, the way that you pose this question to them, you have to be a bit careful about it. You say, okay, you decide how you would like wealth to be distributed and then based on what you tell us with, uh, pretend anyway, that with one fifth probability, you're gonna be dropped into one of these quintiles and that's the amount of wealth you're gonna have. Uh, this is based on uh, a philosophy of, of ethics um, due to the American philosopher, John Rawls called the, the veil of ignorance. You pretend that you don't know where you're gonna get dropped in society. Forget about whatever wealth you have now. It's going to be taken away from you and you're going to be dropped into one of these five quintiles that you get to choose with those probabilities. So when you put the question to them like that, how would you like these quintiles arranged given that, uh, given that uh, condition, mm -hmm. uh, people want something more equitable than they think the U.S. distribution is. The punchline at the end of this is, here's what the real wealth distribution of the U.S. is in terms of quintiles. Mm -hmm. It is far more unequal than people think it is, which in turn is far more unequal than they would like it to be. Mm -hmm. But even under those conditions, what they would like it to be is not total equality. People are okay with some distribution. Generally speaking, as long as they know, you know, everybody is is being treated equally and fairly people have no problem with some perhaps merit-based uh, 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 variants of, of wealth yeah. okay mm. fascinating yeah really really good cool 
Listen, uh, Bruce, I think that's really what we're going to have to wrap it up there now. Um, it's been fantastic talking to you. I'm um, looking forward to seeing what you're going to come up with next. <laughs> and, uh, like I say, I have been following your work for some time now. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to my friend Eric Schechter as well, who is a guy who actually introduced me to you. And he's also done some really interesting work on this um, idea where... Um, so, you know, it, describing how the variance in um, distribution of trade is, uh, creates a problem over time. But um, absolutely, thanks a million for talking to me today. I'm really, really happy to talk to you and uh, it's lovely to meet you and good luck with the, your work in the future. Thank you very much, Colin. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, likewise, I've, I've been following uh, your work as well and Eric's. And uh, I hope that these ideas... Uh, catch on more in the future and become more widely known. Absolutely, yeah. And we're, we're feeding into a process that will hopefully uh, improve things in the long run. Yeah. So thanks a million and take care. Thanks for talking. Thank you, Colin.